Okay, welcome back to Doctrine of the Church. And we talked, we covered a lot of historical ground on tradition. Today, I kind of want to have it be more discussion-based, have us uh, chat a bit. I'll, I'll kind of refresh our memory about some of the important themes that we picked up um, real quick at the beginning here. And then we can talk about any of this or anything else that we talked about, any rabbit trails you want to go down uh, or questions you still have. Um, but I tried to corral some important ideas about tradition that we've come across in our study. First is we need to read scripture with the church throughout history. We need to read scripture with the church throughout history. Um, so obviously the word of God is absolutely foundational, um, but we need to be careful to distinguish between um, the authority of the word of God and the authority of my individual interpretation of the word of God. Uh, I am a person located in a particular time and place. I have my own limitations. And if uh, I just try to rely on my own interpretation of scripture, there are probably many ways in which I'll go astray. One way of saying this is that we believe in sola scriptura, scripture alone as the absolute authority, but not solo scriptura not reading the Bible all by myself and, and just figuring it out that way. We go, and, and so in order to be faithful to scripture, we need to uh, listen to what the church has said about it. And one of the ways I think about this is that with various different doctrines, there are various different moments at which they are hashed out in church history. Um, if you really wanna grapple with the doctrine of the Trinity, um, you can start with an introductory book that was uh, written in the contemporary time period. But at some point, if you really wanted to grapple with it at a very deep level, you have to go back and you have to read Athanasius and uh, ba Basil um, of uh, uh, Caesar. You'd have to read um, you know, Basil and uh, Gregory of Nazianzus and Gregory of Nyssa, the Cappadocian fathers. You'd have to read some of the people who actually hashed it out. Just no great substitute for that. Um, you want to really understand what's going on with justification by faith alone, you should probably read Luther and Calvin at some point. In other words, um, there are these moments in church history when the Holy Spirit was teaching the church something. And rather than just reading the scripture on our own, um, we need to learn what those moments of history have to teach us about the scripture. It's important that we let those, uh, let ourselves kind of bathe in those moments of church history every now and then. Um, and I'll just tell you, for me, very practically, one way in which I try to exemplify this is if I'm preaching on a passage uh, from, you know, whatever passage I'm preaching on, I don't just read the most latest up-to-date um, academic commentary or even the most latest up-to-date pastoral commentary. Uh, I go back and I read something from Augustine or from Calvin or from Luther, um, and I often find that the things, the way they approach the text, the questions they ask, the things that they're interested in are very different. And none of this is to say, of course, that the truth isn't ultimately coming from scripture, but I, I really like that image that Schaff gives of scripture as the fountain, but so often tradition being the stream um, that brings the water to us. Um, I, I, when, if I sit and read scripture with Calvin, I find he points me to things in scripture I didn't see on my own. <laughs> and that's true for the whole history of the church. So this stating it as a broad value that we need to read scripture with the church throughout history. Um, we talked, said tradition has authority, but not absolute authority. And that's something that, you know, we can talk about more and try to work out. Um, obviously it's easy to say it, but the details can get complicated. I mean, um, we might be able to get uh, Vincent of Lorraine and Calvin both to sign off on this, but I don't think they're in precisely the same place. Uh, but the basic idea here is that tradition is important. It should have authority for us, but the authority is not absolute because scripture is what has absolute authority. And so we, we can never look at tradition and say that it's inerrant. So that's another thing we can talk some more about. And I'll say one thing to think about under this heading is what are some sort of dysfunctional relationships we can have to authority? Um, we can look at authority and think, I want a human being to tell me what I should know with absolute certainty uh, in the current church, and I won't have 
certainty unless I have an inerrant authority here on earth. Um, that would be, I think, a dysfunctional way to relate to tradition, try to get rid of the anxiety that might come from trying to figure out the truth by saying, oh, I'll just do what the Pope says. Um, it could be an individualism that says I'm the ultimate authority and, and authority is great if it agrees with me. And if it doesn't agree with me, I can just, I'll just completely ignore it. Um, we could talk, think more about that, but that's one heading, like all the ways which we would think about tradition being authoritative for us. This is something maybe I haven't said enough about, so I'll put this up here too. In creeds and confessions, the church authoritatively interprets scripture. So um, we have creeds and confessions. We will say uh, in, in worship service, the Apostles' Creed or the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed or things from the Westminster Confession, and occasionally we do um, Belgic, the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. I think I'm the only one who's ever tried to work the Canons of Dort into our worship of walls, but we've done that too. Um, what we have, these creeds and confessions are pl places and times where the church has come together, either the church very broadly in the Nicene Creed or specifically the Reformed Church in the Westminster Confession or something like that, and put together a document that authoritatively interprets scripture. Notice, not absolutely authoritatively, though. It's not like creeds and confessions are inerrant. Um, and yet, in Presbyterian churches, we tend to believe this is a valuable and important practice. Um, other churches, they might say something more like, well, we have no creed but the Bible. I mean, from a Presbyterian perspective, you look at that and say, um, well, you probably do have <laughs> some kind of creed, right? I mean, there, if somebody gets up in church and uh like if some if the pastor gets up in church and preaches something there's something that if the pastor preached it you would be like this is a problem we need to remove our pastor you just haven't written it down it's much better to have it written down as to here are the here are the boundaries of what we believe here are the 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 lines uh, within which faithful uh, within which we see a faithful biblical interpretation of scripture things outside of it we can disagree about but here's like what our church stands on um so we can talk more about that idea and then finally we had this idea of catholicity small c catholicity so not roman catholic but um the church as a whole um and universally um and we found this idea, which I think is an intriguing idea um, and an important idea that Catholicity can kind of be a control on my individual interpretation of scripture. And we saw that in Vincent of Lorin with his very controversial formula that, okay, so scripture is authoritative, but there's different interpretations of scripture. So what are you gonna do? Well, he thought you have to go with what was taught always everywhere by everyone. But then that becomes a rather difficult standard to apply, right? Because, well, does everybody always everywhere agree in the Christian church? Um, but what he actually means by that is you have to look back to antiquity um, and you have to not just get caught up with, say, what your favorite church father says, but compare it against what all the church fathers say. Um, and you then have to look, uh, hopefully, to you know, if you have a council, which is the whole church coming together and speaking his mind on something, then that's a safer guide because precisely because it recommends, so it represents um, a wholeness in the church. So, I mean, I put truth is in the whole, that's actually Hegel. I just slipped that in there as a, a way of encapsulating what Vincent Lorin is saying here. And I think there's, um, I mean, it's probably worth discussing, but I think there's some truth here that a Christianity that gets closed in on my in individual interpretation or even just really obsessed with the purity of my denomination um, is more likely to end up in some kind of heresy. Um, if you want examples of that from right here in Presbyterianism, that's something we can talk about too. Um, but uh, I think theologically, if we, if, we say, if we don't say only the Presbyterian church is the true church, which I don't think we can say, like, uh, I'm comfortable saying on the grounds of like marks of preaching of the gospel and right administration of sacraments that I'm comfortable saying that I don't think the Roman Catholic Church is a true church, um, for example, but I'm not comfortable saying the same thing about my Baptist brothers or um, various other uh, denominations. If they have the preaching of the gospel and 
a certain level of faithfulness in administering the sacraments and church discipline, then I have to look at that as a true church. And that means that all that stuff about the Holy Spirit guiding people into truth and, uh, and the exercise of authority by their elders and all of that, I kind of have to recognize is the Holy Spirit doing something there too. And that means I can't just be pursuing um, my, my own reformed understanding as reformed as it is, as if this was the only place the spirit was working and I couldn't learn something from those believers in different denominations. Um, and so, I mean, this can be a lot of different things. It can be um, seeking understanding across lines of uh, ethnic division or different nationalities to trying to understand, just as like I was looking through the church throughout history and trying to understand what they have to teach me, what do people who have uh, different ethnic backgrounds or different nationalities, what could they point me to in scripture that I wasn't seeing as clearly, things like that. Um, and it means how in, even engaging with somebody who disagrees doctrinally, at the end of the day, there is truth and falsity to many of these doctrinal, doctrinal matters. Um, but often the truest version of a doctrine is the one that is uh, has listened most carefully to the people that disagree with this. I, I think that. I think the best kind of Arminian theology, if you're thinking about it, like a free will theology, probably the best, most nuanced kind is one that is listened very carefully to reform theology. I think the best version of predestinarian reform theology is one that's listened very carefully to the concerns of uh, Arminian free will brother and has like, I, on the basis of that, tried very carefully to say that God's not, say, the author of evil um, or that people aren't the same as robots or something like that. Um, so even where there is definitely a true and a false in doctrine, I still think we get a better version of the doctrine when we listen very carefully to our brothers who disagree. Um, so we can take that a bunch of different directions. I think it's a very productive idea that seeking um, insights from what the Holy Spirit is teaching all of the church and has taught the church throughout history um, is uh, a good way uh, to control our individual interpretation of scripture and actually have a deeper understanding of scripture, a more true understanding of scripture at the end of it. Um, okay, so there's some things. I've thrown that up, thrown that, kind of thrown those things up on the wall. Um, let me hear from you guys. What do you, what do you want to discuss? What do you, what questions do you have? Well, Jamie, I, I mean, it, it's hard to know where to start with all this, but to me, language is so important and defining our terms is so important. And when I've said this before, I think in this series, to, to me, it's problematic to, to use the term the church because it's so diverse. And if we're talking about when um, leaders came together to make decisions, which uh, by and large have been accepted, uh, and we have definitely said this is orthodoxy, um, those are the um, things that have been handed down, so therefore traditions, which is what the word means, uh, that we feel comport with the scripture and with uh, what, um, I forget the chap's name, who says this is held by everybody everywhere all the time. Vincent of Loren, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but I, I, I think th this is an issue because just to be very simplistic, John 14, 6, our Lord says, I am the truth. Yeah. So that the lightning rod of all God's work and revelation is centered in that person. And so the preparation for it, we believe, is the Old Testament. The expression of it is the, is the Gospels, the expansion of that gospel in Acts, and the explanation of it in the epistles. It's all about him. Uh, and so how everything must cohere and be seen in Christ and through him, as, as, as Luther made so clear, and it's a wonderful, I think, expression, we no longer have this so-called theology of glory where we can sort of, me and God, just I go directly to God. I must pass through the cross. I must pass through that prism and that prism gives me a light to all other truth. I won't see it right if I don't see it there. So that, for example, that the marks of a true church are 
the, the proper preaching of the word and the right administration of the sacraments and discipline to me is insufficient because if there is not present the love of Christ and of one another, to that extent, whatever is believed is, is not taking hold of people. So I'm just saying in all of this, we must define our terms carefully. We must avoid, I think, formulas unless they are all explained, particularly for folks that um, we want to encourage to read the past because we do stand on their shoulders. So anyway, that's my feeling. I, just being careful about our terms, focusing it on Christ and seeing everything through that prism of, of his life, his sacrifice, not only in death, but th through the whole of his life. And that we are to imitate that, taking up our cross. So um, to the extent that the things that have been decided and that we stand on as truth have come through that, and they certainly have because there was so much opposition uh, to these things. That's where I think we can profit, not just from even what they determined and decided, but how they did it, what it cost, and how wonderful to be a part of that, the bigger church, as you're talking about, people of God. So it's David, I think what you're sort of doing is adding to the Reformation marks of the church, a kind of a pietist, uh, and I don't use the word pietist in a negative sense. I have appreciation for the pietist tradition, but what you're saying is that there has to be a, a, a genuine um, love for Christ and his people mm -hmm. as part of an, a, a fourth mark of the church. Well, I don't see in scripture a one, two, three marks of the church. I, I see Jesus saying, uh, if he's commanding us, what's well, the first commandment to love God with all our heart and our neighbors ourselves, And all he does is expand that and show the depths of it uh, in his own life and insist on it in his followers. So if, if what we are defining as the church is without that, it's a definition without life. It, it's in statement only, it seems to me. And, you know, yeah. we do not hear this as a word, but doers. John says, if you don't love your brother whom you do see, you cannot love God. And if you do not love God, you're not a Christian. It's that simple. I don't care what you profess. So, that's, that's, I think, something that's got to be there. It's, it's the heartbeat of real Christianity. So I think that, I guess the question I'd have about that is the marks of the true church, and, and you're right, there's no one Bible passage where Jesus was like, by the way, here's the marks of the true church. And in fact, there's a number of different schemes for marks of the true church in Reformed theology. So, you know, so... Some people don't add discipline separately. Some people do. Some people expand scripture to ordinance. Yeah, there's a bunch of, because what we're trying to do is like look faithfully what the Bible say, says that says that the church is supposed to be. To mm -hmm. some extent, that's easier. And then we have to say, wait, but of like the ideal that scripture presents us, like what's the baseline for your true church, which is always going to be, even, even within the categories, like, well, how rightly do you have to administer the sacraments? <laughs> like if, you know, you're, you know, there are all kinds of details about the sacraments. Are those disqualifying? So yeah, these are like difficult categories. I think that the question I have about adding, say, genuine love is that the march of the true church are kind of supposed to, the, their purpose is supposed to guide me in recognizing um, the visible church. That, that's my understanding of it. And um, I can't directly observe the hearts of the believers in the church. And so to some extent, like, that uh, it's going to be based upon uh, how their love is evident to me. We're not talking about how God recognizes the true church, because obviously he has a very different perspective than ours. But um, I'm trying to find, like, where are the Christians who are living things out faithfully? So, I mean, I don't know. I feel like what to the extent that love is expressed externally, at, um, it might fall under discipline, or, or do we need a separate subcategory for 
what what is it like what 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 is it that like you, that you as somebody who's trying to look and and see uh where 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 is this church that jesus talks about that is obviously very important i'm supposed to be involved in is it you know sh should i join a roman catholic church or is it acceptable to me like these these are the kinds of questions i think that spark march of the true church so how does like love fit in how do i recognize that because i mean i I could meet a Roman Catholic who seems like a very loving person. Like, do you get what I'm asking? Yeah, I, but it, to me, how do we answer the simple question that Jesus, he didn't answer it as a question. He said, makes it a statement. By this yes. shall all men know that you are my disciples. And he doesn't speak a doctrine. He says that you have love for one for another. And that love is to love one another as I have loved you. And that takes in Christology, it takes in the Holy Spirit, it takes in any kind of activities that you have in public worship or in private life. So it's comprehensive. And if we can't formulate that into the way we're defining what a Christian is and therefore church is, to me, that's what I'm saying, it's lacking. It's not just pietistic. I would not give it such a label because that puts it in a class sort of off in a corner and Jesus puts it center stage. And it seems to me, so does first John. I mean, that's what John's talking about. And he's the disciple who Jesus loved. That's the way he defines himself. So yes, love has feet, it has manifestation. Um, and I don't think we stress this enough in our heritage of standing on justification by faith alone. And, and, and that love is should be true love for christ should be that which mostly motivates us not to sin to 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 do what the lord says if you love me you keep my commandments so if we that isn't there and there in in the in my opinion the essence and pressure that jesus makes it we're failing we're not presenting the whole truth yeah so, i guess i mean I just want to distinguish between defining what the church is and saying what are the marks by which we can recognize it, which is what I take the marks of the true church to be, um, which, I mean, those are slightly different things. But you're right. Jesus does say we'll recognize the church by its love. So I guess the question is, since I can't see into the heart of people, like, what does it actually cash out to? And maybe it's not sufficiently overlapped with the other three marks to be a separate mark of... Or, or a supermark, like in all three of them, <laughs> you're supposed to see that love, but. I'd say it's a pervasive mark. Yeah. It's pervasive. It's everywhere. It's to be everywhere. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> it's changing diapers if you're a mother. Yeah. It's, you know, wiping the floor. It's uh, um, suffering with somebody. It's staying by their bedside. It's giving when you don't have it to give the last mite. It, you know, it's all of those things. Uh, if they're coming and uh, you're right, you, we can't see the heart and somebody could mask that and the hypocrites certainly tried to. And a lot of Jesus ministry with them was unmasking the phoniness of their very disciplined kind of religion. So we must be aware of that. And you know that, that we all do. We're so prone to be Pharisees about things and it's a danger. So anyway, I've said enough. <laughs> Jamie, I'm wondering if uh, part of this is kind of that that other distinction, like the visible versus the invisible, or the objective nature of the church versus the subjective, uh, is is maybe part of the question where um, not everyone and is not everyone is truly Israel. That kind of idea, maybe that's what David is kind of getting at. So you have the marks, but not everyone in the building is necessarily truly a believer but yet there's still like the categories and the boundaries of like this is what the church is yeah and i mean in the text david cited for us that jesus did say that it, the church will be known by our love so he must be talking about something that could be communicated as the visible church and not just the invisible church there but you're right there's an important distinction that we ultimately are never able to know for sure um, like what's going on in somebody else's heart. Um, and that often comes up very importantly in, 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 
and for instance, in the Donatist controversy, which was a whole debate about, um, well, here, let's set up the dilemma here. Um, you're baptized by somebody, you know, somebody leads you to faith in Christ and baptizes you, and then they leave the faith entirely. Does your baptism not count now? Um, and the Donatists said, yes, you need to be rebaptized. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, and Augustine said said no. Actually, it's uh, God can work faithfully through the church, even even potentially through um, uh, uh, an apostate minister. Now, nothing. This is one we have to balance carefully. I don't think you want to suggest that that's like normal or expected, or that um, say true faith would make no difference to a minister. All all he's saying is that. Um, we don't need to, um, we, we, we can trust God's promises given to us in the visible church without having to always discern individually where faith is in every single heart. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think, I think, you know, visible and visible church could be part of it, but Jesus seems to think that like something about that is becomes visible church. <laughs> Uh, well, I have a, a question then yeah. about this, because I was looking in Colossians 1, 4, and I don't know if it's, this is there in any of the other letters of Paul, but it's, Paul says, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. So he says, we thank God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 3, and he says, because of those two things. So, so it sounds like Paul would, is recognizing that right that he's recognizing that they not only that they have faith in jesus but they also have love for one another and i guess i i, I would ask that in relation to the things that have already been discussed um yeah i mean how does i mean i i kind of wondered that how does paul know so sure yeah. you know so surely that that they have love for one another yeah, and I think that is where, you know, with all of the discussions of visible and invisible church that have happened since, as important a category as it is, I don't think that we should think of them as, as normally and fundamentally disconnected, such that, you know, um, wow, here's this person who is, um, sure looks like a faithful Christian, sure looks like they're really loving, but I should never draw the conclusion that they actually are because I could be surprised. I think it enters at the level of I'm very, I'm fallible in my interpretation of other believers. And it could turn out that I'm wrong, but that doesn't mean I, I should assume I, I'm always wrong. Faith works through love, as Paul says in Galatians. And uh, so I don't think we should hesitate to look at somebody and say, you know, I see your faith. I see your love. Um but in, you just realize that you might, it might, there might turn out to be situations where, wow, I, I really thought that person's faith was genuine. Maybe it's, you know, but they've fallen away. Maybe it still is. Maybe like there's a bigger story that God is working through with them. Maybe not. We have to leave some room for the fact that um, we don't see the heart and God's operations can be pretty mysterious. But I don't think we should let that skepticism. I, I think there's this actually. Uh, you see it a lot in early modern philosophy. Um, we're not infallible, therefore we can't know anything. Well, no, that's actually, that's, that's, that's not a good step. That's not a valid step. We are fallible, but that doesn't mean that we basically need to um, question whether we know anything at all. It's just that we're always fallible in our knowing of it. So, yep, you're right. Paul absolutely commends people for their faith and their love, and we should encourage other believers as well when we see the work of the spirit in them and their faith and their love, even though uh, we're fallible and we don't see the heart the way God does. Well, and I just realized as, as you were saying this, Jamie, that in the, at the end of the book, he mentions Demas, right? In 414. So I guess that was one case where Paul was wrong, right? Because Demas was the one who deserted him later. Um, yeah. I mean, that's an interesting <laughs> That, that's an interesting example there, but certainly there's somebody who seemed to be very faithful and then, then wasn't. I, I think Paul takes people at their confession. You know, they confess something and he 
puts the best construction on that he can because he loved these saints. He, 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 he knew what they had come out of and he, he loved them and he commended them. But look at what he has to go through with the Corinthians. Uh, I mean, it's all the things that they had to clean up and he works through it systematically, but he loved them and he felt like they loved one another even though they had the visions. In the Thessalonian group, they, they had huge love for one another and kindness and they loved Paul, but some of them were, were lazy. They were not working. Uh, they were having a problem and there were perhaps some sexual issues there and he addresses them so that the perfection of this love is always, isn't it, what we're working towards. What, wherever the need is, What's the need at Wallace? What's, well, that boils down to what's the need in the couples, the families, and the individuals that are at Wallace and coming together as a congregation uh, as, as we think about this. Um, you know, it's always something that is uh, something that we need to examine ourselves over, but then immediately go to the Lord and say, oh, you know, only you can direct us. You can, through your word, through your servants, through the the... Uh, history of the church and the blessings of others make us more like Jesus. You know, that it's the perfecting of love, isn't it? Isn't that really what we're after? That's the point. Paul actually, um, I was thinking about this as we've been doing Galatians study in our Young Adults Fellowship Bible study. Paul uses a uh, fulfilling language for both don't fulfill the works of the flesh and mm -hmm. for the, the desires of the spirit. So we got like Paul's clear in Galatians. We have like lust of the flesh, and then we have like lust or desires of the spirit. And both of those are going on in us. But one of them is going to become the thing that is perfected and completed in us. And, and, so, yeah. That's, and so, yeah, that's where, that's where we're, you know, where he calls us to strive is to um, work towards the perfection of the, the love that the spirit's working in us. Yeah. I'd like to go back to different topic that you yes. raised here, the topic of tradition, and uh, compliment you on your uh, uh, determination, or at least your desire to find uh, other uh, past, uh, uh, in the past history of the church, people like Luther to read or Augustine to read uh, on, uh, when you're working on a particular text. Um, I, I guess I have the question. I, I, first of all, I compliment you on that goal. And then how realistic is it that this is going to be possible for very many in the church to do? Um, it's, uh, I, I, I'm reading right now a, a book that my son-in-law brought me uh, my attention to, Interpreting Scripture in the Great Tradition. Mm. Um, by Carter, Craig Carter, it, uh, uh, a critique of the uh, historical criticism of the uh, Bible that's been dominant for the last couple hundred years and uh, a desire to return to reading the scripture the way the ancients did. I, I, I guess I have the, uh, the question for you, Jamie, is how can you, how can you apply this to the average pew sitter? So that's actually a really great question. And you're very right to point out that um, not all of us have the same amount of time because we have different vocational callings in the world and those are good. So I, I would definitely not want anybody to leave with the impression that man, like I'm wasting all my day working as an engineer and I don't have time to do really spiritual things like read the church fathers because <laughs> I think what we learned, what we learned in the Reformation is like, no, God's called you to be an engineer or, or whatever. I think it's going to be a community project. Um, first of all. So there are going to be some people who are called to be straight up academics, studying theology academically. And if you're, if you're working as a theologian in the church, then it's incumbent upon you to be somebody who knows the tradition, I think, even if it's not your area, which clearly it's not my area as an Old Testament scholar, but I think it's important for me to like put a certain amount of hours, not just into how I'm, I'm interpreting the scripture as an Old Testament professor, but in fact, in terms of how my interpretation of the Old Testament fits with the tradition in the church. So obviously we're gonna have some people and that is and that is something that we all should be thinking about. I mean, I've noticed that as communities, we encourage people 
to different sorts of things. I think in evangelicalism, we encourage people to become biblical scholars in a big way. And a lot of great biblical scholars are evangelicals. I've noticed in my time with Roman Catholics, and especially being in, at Catholic University and interacting with Catholics who are academics, that Catholics encourage their bright young people to be philosophers a lot more than evangelicals do. Um, so, I mean, this is not, you know, there's some great evangelical philosophers, there's some great Roman Catholic Bible scholars, but I noticed there's like a community difference in like what we value that um, affects where, where, where some of our young theologically or philosophically attractive people end up. So what I'd say is one thing that we can do as a community is, is encourage people who want to study the church fathers as a academic career. Um, so that's, that's just something we could all have as a value. If we all think it's important, then we can support people who do it. Um, then for people who are, uh, uh, who are pastors, obviously we are supported by the congregation. And so we have more time. We should probably be using some of that time, like I was describing, to think about making sure we're in touch with the church. What about for like an, egg, an average congregant? And I think what, what I think that would look like is thinking about spending a little bit of your de devotional time, perhaps reading a bi Christian biography or um, uh, some kind of uh, some kind of book. I mean, we mentioned Shaft as being very readable. I think if you're at Wallace, like Devo Lid, <laughs> that's one of the things that one of the things I think is really cool that happens at Wallace right now is that Joanna Lamb has like a whole group that's dedicated to reading classic works of Christian spirituality, um, and uh, I you know it's it's going to be stuff that's from farther back in church history. So. Like one very practical way that you could get a little bit of uh, church history in your life with somebody who actually knows what they're talking about to guide you through it would be just to go to Devo Lit. So if you're able to do that, that's something that you could do at Wallace. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to like place like a huge pressure on individual members to think they need to be putting hours and hours into that. Um, but with the hours that you already have that you um, put into like um, grow, Christian growth um understanding scripture you know to take a little bit of that time to not just read the bible yourself but understand somebody in church history who also can read the bible with you that's that's my would be my advice yeah i would only add david uh, and jamie to that is that it's really helpful when uh, the pastor actually mentions something he's reading like david you mentioned what you're reading and, and things that uh, are accessible. I know Michelle Kavanaugh, our church librarian, has a has her book table uh, periodically, but it would be lovely for the pastor to mention, this is a book, it's in our library, it commended, it focuses on this, and if you're interested in that area, which is valuable, without doing a big book review, just to say a couple things, that really goes a long way, because it encourages people to read and uh, I think people have more time to read than perhaps they use it for, but they also know, need to know what is there and where you can get it. So, and we've got a nice church library, so good place to start. We should come up with things to read and then we should come up with, uh, with, with YouTube links for great YouTube videos to watch. <laughs> I don't know, for, my, for me, my generation, I, I will watch YouTube videos just as taking a break sometimes. So, and, and you know what? Like, there's a lot of great educational content on YouTube. I should try yep. to figure out where the best church history stuff is because I know it's out there. Other thoughts or questions? Uh, thank you for this work you've been doing, yep. Jamie. Um, you've really gone into quite a bit of depth here with some of these uh, topics um, um, for a, a Sunday school class. Well, you know, maybe now that I've done it once and I know what I think about things, I can do it more briefly in the future. <laughs> but thanks. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Jamie. The other thing I was thinking is... Um, you know, part of your devotions or part of devotions could also be just like read a couple questions of the, you know, the shorter catechism and look up the verses 
mm. which isn't as as you know time consuming, but certainly there's that great little app uh, with the West with all the reformed creeds. I don't know if anybody has that, but it has like all the confessions, the Belgian confession, the you know Heidelberg Catechism, all the Westminster things, and it's I think it was put out by Westminster uh, West. Mm. It's blue. If you look, if you look for Reformed creeds, and that's a really good one to uh, just kind of have on your phone. You can, you know, look at a question or two. Yeah, actually, that's really great advice. And thanks for mentioning that. Um, one of the nice things about creeds and confessions is that they are like highly concentrated theology. Like there's no time wasted. It's very concisely stated. And that can be a lot to unpack. Um, but one of the, you know, it, it, it can also like bring in a bunch of nuances. I remember when I was in college, that was kind of often the first place I'd go, you know, in college, meeting a bunch of different Christians and like, you get to think about, oh, what baptism? What, what, what should I, you know, what do I think about baptism? And often that looking up the chapter on baptism and then like looking at the proof texts, like to, which are not, you know, not necessarily giving us the whole biblical grounding, but certainly give us a good start. Um, to get thinking about that topic and thinking about how the confession would put things was a great start, a great start for understanding a lot of these different doctrines. So, um, yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, I would add my amen to that, Chris. Uh, 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 an ex, one of the greatest preachers I ever heard, he's so simple, it's just astounding. His name is Stuart Alliott. He's a Baptist. And he said, the uh, greatest non-inspired document uh, in fact, the greatest document next to the Bible, which is inspired, is the shorter catechism, except for one phrase. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that is that the infants of believers are to be baptized. <laughs> I would, yeah. <laughs> Members of the visible church are to be baptized. But I know it's been a joy to me. I've taught it in English and Spanish, and uh, it's just wonderful to, to see it take hold of people. And as you said, Jamie, it's this it's this uh, concentrated, marvelous uh, summary of that which we ought to always believe. And every Monday I go through it as I walk and, and, and I memorized it a long time ago. And it's just such a joy to cover from um, the absolute beginning of glorifying God until the final phrase of the Lord's prayer. Um, it's just so encouraging, so. I commend it. <laughs> also, if you're interested in particular topics, feel free to email email me for for like rec recommendations for church history topics along particular lines of interest. I'd be happy to help with that. I used to do that stuff professionally for the Westminster Bookstore, so <laughs> always happy to help with that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, it's about time to head off to... Um, worship so i'm going to go ahead and close us in prayer and so again just for um for next week we're starting a new segment in the class where we'll be talking about um elements of worship different uh things that happen in the worship service and we're going to try to think about what's the biblical basis for each one of them and how sh and how should we think about what's happening so let me go ahead and close us in prayer dear heavenly father we um we thank you that uh we ha do have this faithful example of your spirit's work and so many other saints to help throughout history to um, guide us in um, uh, understanding your scripture. And we thank you even more that we do have your scripture, which is uh, perfectly true and authoritative, even more than any of the uh, human expressions that's been given to it over the years. We thank you that we still have your spirit active among us, guiding us into the truth. Um, we pray that you would help us uh, to be dependent on your spirit and dependent on your word. We pray that you would help us to uh, listen to other Christian brothers and sisters and um, understand your word better through that means. And we pray that you be with us as we worship you today. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to worship you in uh, repentance uh, for our sin. Help us to uh, worship you in a way that sees the grace you've offered to us and accepts it joyfully in Christ. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.